Dominic, welcome back to the Mr. Beacon podcast. It's great to have you on. Thank you, Steve. It's great to be on. I always learn a lot. One of the joys of this show is, um, you know, I get to talk to uh, super interesting people and I learn something every time I do it, especially with you. This is actually the third time you've been on the show. The first time was back in 2018. If people want to go through the Mr. Beacon archives, they can. We talked about uh, your book, uh, Building the Web of Things. Uh, and then you were back 2020 uh, talking about GS1 again, uh, talking about Digital Link. So one question I have, and I guess I could answer this question myself, but I'm a bit lazy. So do you still have the things that are referenced in the book that you use in the exercise? Are they still operating at the Everything Lab in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the East End? I assume that's where they were. Are those yeah actually that's a very good question yeah unfortunately not and it happened a couple of months ago uh, oh, no. some of the components broke down and okay. we're looking to replace them but it's pretty hard because we want to have the exact same components and ah. yeah things have evolved so quickly that they are hard to find but yeah I think we've we've managed to spot them and we're gonna okay. we're gonna rebuild it yeah. excellent and and we should explain what on earth we're, we're, we're talking about so uh, building the web of things um, give a one kind of a one minute intro to what the book is about. Uh, but basically what we're talking about is the devices that you can use using web APIs and you control physical things from your, you know, I was sitting in uh, San Diego following these exercises. It was really cool. I was looking at a camera and uh, driving actions and turning lights on remotely. But what, what, what was that book about? Well, pretty much what you just said. So it's it's about okay. using web technologies to build the Internet of Things, which I believe is the right way to build the Internet of Things if we really want to make, make it massive. Excellent. But we're not here to talk about that now. We're to, here to talk uh, primarily about uh, EPCIS 2.0, which I think is a very significant standard. I mean, GS1 has some pretty significant standards uh, in its portfolio. But this, I think, uh, is really going to enable a lot of very important use cases uh, that will make the supply chains uh, much more efficient, which is essential if we're going to solve climate change and uh, do it in a way that aligns people and planet and profit. Um, I also want to talk to you a bit about the fact that uh, you now work for a different company, but you never quit. You uh, uh, Everything is now part of Digimark. So uh, let's, uh, let's talk about that. But um, so sound OK uh, in terms of our agenda? Sounds great. Okay, so what is EPCIS? What is EPCIS? So first of all, it stands for Electronic Product Code Information Service. Um, the Electronic Product Code, so the EPC standard, is a, is, a, is a standard that basically provides unique identities for items, in particular uh, through RFID technologies, but it can be applied somewhere else. And the EPCIS standard itself is, is the information server that um, or the information services that you build on top of these unique uh, product identities. But as you say, the identities in EPCIS don't have to be RFID. In fact, one of the things that um, you just sent me, like, it's actually very distracting a few minutes before the show, was uh, you showed your company's product, um, everything um, integrating with Williot's uh, sensors. Uh, and so it seems like uh, it's, it's, it's an open standard from that perspective. Yeah, it's definitely an open standard, um, absolutely. And, uh, and it's also not a new standard, but the version 2.0 is, is, is really a revolution in terms of what, what it brings and what it is. Yeah, so let's let's come back to that. How uh, version two is different to version one? Because I think version one, I was always a bit frustrated. I, I thought this is really useful, but I really couldn't find many people using it. There were people using it, yeah. but not as many as you would want. So we can get into why that's changed. Um, but let's, you know, I in in this part of the uh, in our conversation, I do want to look at, um, you know, uh, what it is and, uh, you know, when it was originally conceived and how that's changed and where it's being used and why you would use it and how you would use it. And by some amazing coincidence, that seems to be a lot to do with the structure of the standard as well, this uh, what, when, where, why, how. So maybe we should kind of go into that and uh, 
I hope I haven't made this too complicated by use uh, by overloading the same words and using the, them for the structure of our conversation and the structure of the standard. But uh, tell us more about EPCIS and the, the what, when, where, why, and how. Yeah, so so the, the core goal of EPCIS is to capture, capture supply chain events in a standard manner. It's as simple as that. You have tons of events happening in supply chains, and nowadays a lot of them are not digitized, which is one of the reasons why uh, supply chains are not that efficient or resilient to big changes, as we've seen with COVID and, and other events. Um, so it's all about capturing the events in a standard way with the aim of interoperability. So really being able to share these events across partners, share these events with applications. Um, it's basically a common language for things that can happen in supply chain. Excellent. That's what it is at its core. And, and so one of the things that got me excited is that in our, you know, the, the work that we're doing uh, at Williot, we're looking to share information much more broadly and a richer set of information. So like sensor information, uh, information about um, temperature excursions for vaccines or pork chops or, you know, anything. Uh, and you know, micro location events, understanding when shelves are out of stock. And, 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 and this, and also one of the things that became really clear to me was this needs to be shared. In the past, a lot of this information was kind of stovepiped and the retailers had it, but they didn't share it either because, you know, there was some feeling that this was power that they didn't want to give the the vendors and I think more likely it was just too difficult to share and so how can uh, the you know the structure of EPCIS help facilitate um, uh, sharing um, the kinds of location and sensing information that I just described yeah sensing information I mean location was already um, in the standard early on sensing information is one of the news in uh, EPCIS 2.0 so we wanted this standard to support IoT use cases um, for me the the, the Willow pixels were a source of inspiration because they represent one thing that I always thought was going to be a, a trend which is that tagged tags are getting closer and closer to embedded devices and vice versa right and so the standard is, is ready to support that um, by um, allowing to attach to events, um, sensing data in a structured and semantically understandable way. So that really fosters interoperability. Okay, so, so going back to what, when, where, why, and how. So how do you capture the what? What's the, the link there? I think you touched on it, but I just so, want to crystallize it. Yeah, so the what is really the identity. Which unique identity did you see? Um, and it used to, the, the EPCI standard used to support only one way of describing these identities, and that was using an EPC code. An EPC code is typically something that's stored in um, RFID tag, UHF RFID tags. Um, version two of the standard is actually supporting other ways of identifying items. And one uh, in particular is using digital links. You can see that I've, I've, I've worked hard with the team to make sure that the two standards were basically compatible. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so that means now you can, you can address all kinds of things. They don't have to have an EPC as long as they have uh, something that's um, usable as the digital link. Um, then you can you can address them. Cool. So that's the what, and then yep. uh, what's the when? The when is the trivial one. That's just a date timestamp, which is extremely important in supply chain, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that um, let's just expand that a little bit more. So I want to look at how, uh, the, the the time that a good moved from one place to the other which can be important if I want to get a, a picture of, um, uh, say, some zucchinis, how long they were exposed um, to certain temperatures in a certain place, uh, that would be... Exactly. If you, tie this, if you tie this with IoT data, it becomes even more, even more relevant to have the, the when, definitely. And how do you capture the where? What can where encompass? So where are what 
um, what's called in standard business locations. So they're, um, they can be all kinds of places um, that you define as a company. So it, it could be a warehouse, um, it could be a particular production plant. Um, and sometimes they're identified by uh, via GS1 identifiers as well called uh, GLNs, global location numbers. Mm -hmm. So you can also codify in a unique way um, the, the place that the event is happening in. And so can a GLN be like hierarchical? Um, so I, I uh, so I have a place and then I have places within the place. Yeah, you can have you can have this type of hierarchies. Yeah, very good. So why the the, the why that's less obvious uh, in terms of EPCIS. Yeah, so the why is uh, primarily and I'm oversimplifying here, right? Because the standard is 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 a pretty thick document, right? The why is primarily um, the business step. So which step in the business are you in? when you are recording the event are you at quality control um, are you um, transporting the item are you recycling the item and those what's very interesting is that those terms are also standardized and that's important because there are so many ways of describing a recycling step or a quality control so they're also standardized in a companion standard called the cbv um, and that, that business vocabulary of terms, basically standardized mm -hmm. terms. And you can extend it also if, if your use case is um, not supported by the CVV readily. And lastly, how? What's uh, that about? Well, so the how is the IoT component. So that's about the context. So temperature, humidity, vibration, light mm -hmm. level, anything that you can think about uh, in terms of sensors. And again, there, there's a semantic layer to make sure that if you talk about temperature, typical example, there are so many ways, at least two <laughs> ways, global ways of describing a temperature. And, uh, and so it also contains the units and, um, and that's, you know, that's also standardized. So you have a pretty specific way of capturing sensor data. So you've already talked a bit about the differences between EPCS one and two, but uh, let's so let's come at this a, 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 a different way. Why do you think that EPCS one never really took off uh, to the extent that we hoped it would? And why are you more optimistic about two dot Yeah, and I very much hoped as well, right? It would. And I was listening to the Gartner provisions back then in two thousand, early two thousand, where they said, yeah, RFID would be present pretty much everywhere by twenty. 20, 2019, something like that, right? Didn't really happen. And I think there were two main reasons. One, the standard is fixing. The other one, I think, got fixed by other uh, powers like the COVID crisis and the climate, the, the, the climate crisis as well. Um, the first one is simply what you mentioned, right? That this is information that companies are not necessarily willing to share too much. It's great to have interoperability, but you need to want to share this information and to leverage it across partners. Um, and, and I think the, the world we live in, and especially the last five years or so, um, have really put a lot of pressure for this data to be shared for many reasons. The other one is just technologically, the standard was really painful to work with. Um, and I actually wrote a paper in 2010 where I, I, I suggested giving, um, giving RFID a rest. And that paper was one of the sources of inspiration for GS1 to launch this, um, this standard, not the only one, right? But it was basically adapting the standard to web technologies because it was great in terms of the actual constructs, but the APIs were just so outdated and, and not reflecting the, the, the state of the web. So at the risk of being obtuse. So giving it a RESTful, meaning making it accessible via RESTful APIs. Exactly. You got it. <laughs> okay. And that has been my mission, my mission in life, to bring all things to the web. <laughs> and, and then for anyone that doesn't know what a RESTful API is, what, what, what's that? That's basically, it's basically an API that is done really the web way. And today, 
most APIs are built that way, are built using RESTful constructs. But back when the, the, the first versions of the EPCI standards were written, it wasn't the case. There was another set of standards that was dominating called WS star services or SOAP services. Mm -hmm. That was more like enterprise-y integrations, which almost entirely died nowadays. Um, yeah. So we're optimistic. It's a better standard. Um, the planet is in a stage where there's massive pressure on supply chains. There's war, there's famine, disease, um, and there's also uh, new use cases like um, uh, uh, buy online, pick up in store and delivery that mean that we just need and, 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 and also environmentally, we're being held to high standards. Uh, as well, and there's legislation that is driving carbon accounting and that sort of thing. Does EPCIS have a role to play in that, in the carbon Absolutely. accounting piece? Uh, and how does Absolutely, that... and I think yeah. there's one piece that you're kind of not mentioning explicitly, which I think is important, is the consumer push for transparency. I mean, there's a real push from consumers and brands who actually are transparent and provide accurate detailed information win nowadays, right? And, and that's super important because to be able to provide this kind of um, transparency, traceability information uh, without doing like just broad, broad greenwashing or kind of totally abstract ways of describing it, you need the data. And to have the data, you need to capture it and you need to capture it in a standard way. And so I think that's one, one other big, big aspect. So EPCIS can be a means of tracking the carbon footprint, the actual carbon footprint, rather than the estimated carbon footprint at each stage. Is that fair to say? It, yeah, it can be. On its own, though, there's no construct in the EPCIS standard that will uh, let you just extract a carbon footprint, right? But you know where the, the goods have transited, and that's, that's very useful. Um, and carbon footprint is one aspect, but just the whole transparency around how is the item produced? Is it organic cotton? Um, can you prove it? You know, these kind of things. So I think the carbon is one aspect, but there, there are many more aspects to a transparency use case. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so how does this compare to EDI? So I was at the GS1 Connect show in San Diego, just down the road from our offices. In fact, we had a group of folks from uh, uh, from AIM and GS1 come to, to visit our offices, and we want to have more open houses uh, like, like that. Um, but uh, I was at the show, and there's a lot of EDI players in the ED1, EDI uh Sorry, at the GS1 conference, um, how does uh, EPCIS uh, compare with EDI? So I'm not an EDI specialist, right? I, I know EDI, uh, but I, it's not something that I've extensively worked with. But the, um, the, the main difference is that EDI is really about, um, is really about you know, the transactions in the supply chain that are usually paper-based is to digitize that, right? When we exchange, mm -hmm. when you exchange goods with, um, I don't know, a kind of, you know, transporting from a warehouse to another place and there's an actual exchange or there's paperwork that's done at the border, this is where EDI can help. EPCIS is a lot more granular than EDI because it's really capturing every single step, not just the steps that absolutely require pa paper trails. Mm -hmm. Um, so EDI is a replacement for these paper documents. EPCIS is really, we want traceability across the board, the entire life cycle of the item, capturing every single step. So it seems like EPCIS is a, a great complement to serialization, but can you use it without serialization? You couldn't before. Um, and the reality is that while the standard didn't allow that, what we discovered is that most uh, users of the standards were actually also track, tracking GTIN level, so class level. Today, it can support it, and that's because of the Trojan horse that's in the standard, and that's uh, the digital link, which basically can support serialized, but also non-serialized, or also partially serialized, as in batch level, for instance. So anything that the digital link supports today can be supported. Um, by the EPCIS. Having said that, you really um, unveil the power of EPCIS if you use uh, item level. That's really when it becomes the most interesting. 
where each, it's not just I've got a SKU for a certain type yeah. of product. I've actually, every single product has a digital passport. It's an individual. You can see where it has come from, who's owned it, how many times it's been washed in a washing machine. Or um, I'm assuming EPCIS could support that. Like uh, I, uh, I want to record every time I've washed my, uh, uh, my jeans or something. Yeah, that... I mean, this is a use case. Is a use case we're not totally unfamiliar with, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, you've you've got uh, um, some great uh, customers at, uh, at everything, including a really great. Uh, I'm not saying that these guys are doing this. Uh, um, quite the contrary, I'm, uh, but uh, but serialization has been adopted by apparel companies. Let's say that and. You know, some great ones like uh, Ralph Lauren, for instance, that have publicly announced they're using your product and serializing uh, things. So um, let's see. Okay, we're optimistic. Um, what's, what are the early signs then? I, I was looking at the standards document and seeing who collaborated. And it's always fun seeing the names and the companies that uh, are there. But uh, who, what are the, can you uh, name drop a few of the companies that you collaborated with on the standard? And, and then, you know, maybe this is, doesn't necessarily mean they're introducing products uh, based on, uh, on that, but I'm interested in who you've been working with on it. Yeah, so the uh, the working group had quite a few members, um, you know, the usual suspects working on, on GS1 standards, but um, also more than this. So in, in terms of the usual suspects, you have the, the big players out there as the Nestle, the PNG, the uh, PepsiCo, uh, Coca-Cola, and so on. Um, I think Johnson & Johnson as well. That's Johnson & Johnson, yeah. yeah. Um, and 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 then the retailers, Walmart and and others, European retailers, Decathlon Carrefour, and yeah. Bosch. And I I, I have the advantage of knowing that I was going to ask you that, so I kind of just jotted down H and M uh, and uh, yeah, H and M was Carrefour there. I'm not sure. I I believe so. Yeah. 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 And then you have vendors as well. So you know what? How are things looking in terms of vendor support? So uh, ev everything supports EPCIS now. Or, uh, yes, yeah, we were supporting it very early on. Um, yeah, it's not it's not the core of our model. It's not necessarily EPCS, but we support EPCS inbound and outbound. That's the idea, right? Um, right. We we add to the standard. We add uh, more because we need it for things like authentication and so on. But we support inbound and outbound. Yeah. And and other vendors that uh, you want to reference, people like Choice. Well, yeah, you have you have lots of uh, big corp vendors, um, you know, the IBMs, the SAP out there. And then you have mm -hmm. specialized companies um, that are mm -hmm. basically that have dedicated their entire workforce on EPCIS. Um, and then you have companies of the size of Digimark, everything. Um, you have a few others like Axway and, and, and so yeah. on. So it's looking good. Uh, uh, people want, uh, if you're going to have adoption, then people need choices. Otherwise, they get a little uh, skittish. Um, so anything else we should talk about? Yeah, I want to talk about Digimark and w what's uh, uh, life is like now. That, that But um, anything more that we need to talk about with EPCIS before we... Well, maybe on, in terms of traction um, and the early market science, I'm also very, very enthusiastic because, yeah, there were other people in this working group um, than the usual suspects. There were a number of startups. There were also a number of blockchain-related companies, yes. which is new. And it makes sense because a lot of the blockchain... Use cases beyond cryptocurrencies is about supply chain traceability. And so there are also a number of blockchains out there like Origin Trail, IOTA, that now also support EPCIS data. And it's great because they need that, right? They needed a kind of a, a common language because uh, these blockchains are fairly incompatible with one another. So having a higher level language was really useful for them. Um, so, so that was one great thing. And the other great thing is just the feedback, the amount of feedback we got. Like a year ago, I was announcing in another podcast that the standard was going to come out. Uh, it took a year. And the reason it took a year from that time to now is community feedback. We had an overwhelming amount of feedback from the community, something that I had never seen on a standard before. 
And so we need to process all of that. But it clearly shows there's interest and, and, and that th the time is ripe for a traceability um, data standard. Yeah, do you want to name drop that podcast? Because I actually started subscribing to it this morning after uh, listening to your uh, interview. Uh, uh, yeah, that's get getting APIs to work. Um, yeah, that's a good one. it's one of one of my favorite podcasts. It would be after yours, though, which I <laughs> always listen to. And I'm being honest here, not just because I'm I'm in. Well, I, it, that really. that means more to me than I I, I can say. I'm going to start getting emotional now. Uh, so, uh, but that's uh, uh, yeah, it's a very cool. Uh, so worthwhile catching that. And you go through this if people want a kind of a, another w drink at this to absorb what EPCIS is. Then I recommend those uh, uh, those uh, podcasts um, as well. Um, just say a bit more about blockchain. So the architecture of how you would integrate EPCIS with blockchain, because a lot of people might think that, they're, oh, these are two different things. Yeah, and to a large extent, they are. Like one thing that I wouldn't advise um, anyone to do is just to push every single event um, in a atomic format that comes from the supply chain to a blockchain, right? That for many reasons that wouldn't scale, uh, depending on the blockchain, that could also not be a good idea from a sustainability standpoint, um, but also from a cost standpoint, knowing like blockchain fees and so on. They're not all blockchains are equal there. You also have private blockchain con consortium base where you can afford pushing the actual raw events. But um, there's a real, um, there's a real trend towards routing some of the supply chain data onto the blockchain so that you can you can basically prove that the data wasn't tampered with, that it was recorded by the by the people who said they were recording it using digital signatures, um, like verifiable uh, credentials and, 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 and tools like this. So essentially, it can add a trust layer on top of an EPCIS uh, scenario. And that's pretty exciting, actually. And I know you've done a little bit of work with uh, uh, with our technology. Um, I mean, everything was one of our first uh, um, uh, platform partners. Uh, we both have platforms, but they were integrated. Um, and um, I, I know you've been um, doing some kind of some early work on integrating EPCIS as supported by everything with uh, Williot. How can you just overview what that would look like? How it would work? I mean, this was super smooth because, like, if you want a tag that can illustrate um, the IoT functions of the EPCIS, I don't think there's a better tag than the Willow tag, right? I mean, the Willow pixels are exactly uh, the kind of tags we had in mind when we were designing that part of the standard. So it's a lightweight tag, yet it's something that can record um, environmental contextual data. So we just, um, we just, made the two platforms talk and we received the message in 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 the Willot um, formats and we convert them to epcis and then we use that to drive uh, things like inventory um, temperature check um, and so yeah it's great it was very straightforward actually very cool also the tech has evolved quite a bit like i had the chance to test both versions and it's just very impressive how how far you've come i never lost hope <laughs> and I, I'm not disappointed. No, I'm, I'm. We're really happy with version two. Uh, it's. Uh, I mean, there's future versions coming down that are going to be even better. But you, you kind of. I mean, I, you, you look at if I compare it to Windows, like Windows one unusable, Windows two terrible, Windows three. Ah, this is. Uh, you can use this. There's room for improvement. The Windows ninety five, the whole thing just exploded, and I. I'm not going to say whether they're aware at Windows 95 or Windows 3, but you can definitely deploy, I would say, hundreds of millions of these tags and have profound changes to your business. But, uh, you know, we're, 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 there's also some major improvements coming. Um, actually, the other thing that I wanted to ask you about, I wanted to ask your opinion about something, um, which is, uh, let's put this in the realm of preview market testing. Uh, and this is a surprise for you, so uh, feel free to not comment. But, um, you know, I've always been passionate about uh, physical web. Um, uh, we had Scott, who was the author of physical web on one of our early podcasts when he was working at Google. Um, 
And one of the things that we're starting to experiment with now at Williot is essentially a reboot of uh, physical web. We're not sh quite sure what to call it. We, we, we're thinking, you know, trusted physical web is because there's a, a level of encryption and a new approach to classification and, uh, and, and kind of uh, making sure that you don't get some of the content there that basically killed the original uh, physical web. Uh, but we're also thinking of calling it uh, um, a living web because, you know, if you have a URL that's being broadcast from everything around you, then it's about life and it brings things to life and allows you to interact. And uh, so, you know, our idea is um, uh, we have a few restrictions. You know, our core product, these guys are on a mission, so we can't change the core product. Our core product uh, broadcasts an encrypted ID. So... Uh, what we're considering building is kind of a proxy layer that m maps uh, uh, Williot IDs to uh, URLs. So it could be a digital link, could be something that your nephew knocks up on a, on a you know on a web page. And the idea is we open this up to any browser that wants to include it, but we'll uh, we'll have a reference open source browser that people can play with. And then, you know, you go to the zoo and you have a URL being broadcast from each of the exhibits. You go to the airport and you can uh, um, order things from your seat uh, and then go to the concession and pick it up. You're stuck in a queue waiting to order beer at the Red Hot Chili Peppers concert at Petco Park something that I was doing uh, last week, then you can click on that link, order, and then, you know, just pick it up. Um, so there's a ton of things that you could do. Um, and, um, you know, rather than having Google ranking at the heart of this, which sounded like a good idea to me when I first heard it, but didn't work well because it's kind of non-deterministic. As a publisher, are people going to see my link? Maybe they will, maybe they won't. And then you can get, like, uh, really not very nice content that comes through and, and pollutes the experience. And so we, we're thinking of using more of the, the App Store model where it's classified and you can subscribe to, if you suddenly yeah. want to see all the URLs from furniture, you can. Uh, but if you then you know just want to see things from restaurants, you can do that. And if you want adult content, you can do that. Uh, but by default, you wouldn't. And so all that kind of approach... Uh, where there's some automation and some approval. And uh, basically, we'd give the tags away uh, and just charge a dollar a month for, for, for one of these things. And then eventually less if you start putting URLs on strawberries. You don't want to be paying that. But uh, that's just to kind of get it started. So I wanted your reaction, advice, feedback. Uh, what, what do you think? I mean, that's super exciting. I've always been a, a, you know, a big fan of the physical web. But... Um, yeah, as as you said, it, it was probably killed in the egg by just um, that turning that into a spamming tool, and that was very sad because it could have been really, really a great tool. But again, back to one thing we we're talking about um, is you know we we gotta make this right. We gotta make it work right. We're gonna help. We're gonna make it um, help people and not spam them um, absolutely so i think yeah we need better filtering you you need to be able to proactively say what you're interested in and 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 we need some governance around that to make sure it's uh, it's somehow checked uh, but yeah i would be all in for reviving the physical web i was actually quite sad to see it disappear yeah me too yeah, definitely yeah. I, I mean i used it myself san diego airport we put the physical web tags on signage uh, and we actually did an abc test we had qr codes we had urls short form urls we had nfc tags uh, and we had physical web um, uh, uh, beacons they were from uh, Fi from the beacon folks and they didn't cost a lot it's like 20 bucks or something like that you stick it on there and, um, you know, it was very new technology, uh, but it was amazingly successful. Order of magnitude, better results. If you added up all of the click-throughs we got from URLs, from QR codes, and from people getting up of that, out of their seat and tapping the sign, add all that up, multiply it by 10, that was the conversion rate and the, and, and the, the visits that we got to the, the Good Traveler website, which is a carbon offsetting scheme, which is kind of hard to get people to visit that website, but it, it was great so that convinced me 
this works. And then I was like traveling in Australia and seeing uh, physical web uh, broadcasts from uh, the post office kiosks. I was in Italy, saw physical web on tourist signs. London buses were using it for the schedule. And uh, it yeah. was even in Broadway. Uh, yeah. So anyway. Yeah, there were some uh, great use cases. Unfortunately, it's the, it's the other use cases that killed it, right? But there were some great use cases. And uh, Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have to talk about it more offline. I'd love to get your advice and input about how we can uh, get that classification and uh, have some kind of. It's tricky. How do you? How do you, you want to avoid? Uh, you want to have the right governance around uh, making sure that uh, it's streamlined and so forth. Okay. So I guess that was a little bit of a uh, surprise preview. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't expecting to cover that. Good but, one. Uh, tell us a bit about. Uh, uh, Digimark and uh, everything, and uh, you know why? Uh, why did you do it? And you were one of the co-founders uh, of uh, of everything. And why did Digimark decide that they wanted to do it? Yeah, you know, we we had been ra running everything for about ten years, a bit more than ten years actually, and uh, we needed a step change. I think we we had a um, you know we we always had a pretty good product, pretty good cutting edge tech, but we needed more market reach. And and so we were looking at um, basically getting acquired or merging with a with a bigger entity. And um, as Digimark offered to acquire us, this was great because they had been a partner for many years before. So we were actually working with digital uh, watermarks from Digimark for many years. We were um, bringing them to the web and and bringing them to our customers. So it was a it was a pretty easy. Um, was a pretty easy integration, um, at least at least on the paper. Then, of course, it's always challenging. But the two teams were really, really aligned in terms of the vision, and they had the um, they had the tech side. We had more the software side, so it made absolute sense and has been a great journey, actually. Yeah, I love that technology. We've had them on the on the podcast uh, a while back, um, and uh, I actually, you know. Decades ago, even considered joining the company. Um, uh, I think I got into wireless instead, so worked out. But uh, um, uh, I, I love what they were doing, and they essentially they can hide a, a, a uh, they can hide data and fingerprint in an image, and you can't even see it, but your your phone can. So it's a great way of having a a serious. Another, it's another carrier, so it would be. Uh, uh, it totally makes sense. Um, and so the plan in terms of the future, how does it change your plans? I see the everything website is is still there. Is it still going to? How do you plan to run the the uh, the two companies? Yeah, at least for a period, right? I mean, it, the the integration is still pretty fresh. Um, it happened beginning of 2022, so um, you know, and it takes a long time. So it's um, I don't know whether the everything brand will disappear. Probably not, but in terms of websites, we will merge them. Mm -hmm. In terms of product, I don't expect many changes. Part of what we also want as a as a common company now is to support as many tagging technologies as possible. Whereas um, Digimark had a, a strong focus on watermarking. Part of the acquisition is also about ensuring that we can uh, tap into as many tagging technologies so that we can cover as many consumer products as possible. And I find that quite exciting because um, that's one of the things everything is bringing to the table. The integration with the wheelouts or, or any other um, tagging technology that's out there. We always wanted to be agnostic of mm -hmm. the tagging tech. Very good. Well, that's, I, I, I love what both companies are doing. Uh, and if you can be better together, then uh, uh, that's, that's great from my perspective. Uh, so, Dom, um, this is the part of the show where, where we talk a bit more informally. Not that the first part of the show was particularly formal, but you mentioned that you just moved. You're, uh, you're still in Switzerland, I assume, are you? Yeah, I'm still based in Switzerland, but I... Uh... I moved closer to the mountains, which is one of the things I really love in life is being close to mountains and climbing them. So yeah, makes me really happy to be around here. And, uh, you know, nowadays you can do that because you work remotely. So it doesn't really matter where you work from. Yeah, I was interested in how do you manage a career where, you know, the first time we spoke was it, we were in the east end of London in a very cool kind of uh, office there, which I'm assuming is still there. 
and n now you're part of Digimark, and so they're up in, as far as I remember, uh, just outside of uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, uh, how, how do you manage this kind of multi-location thing? Is it, uh, is it a stress or is it a bonus for you? Well, I mean, that was a reality almost through my entire career. I think, uh, except for the early years of my career, I had to deal with different time zones, sometimes very different time zones, like now between Europe and Portland. You just get used to it. You know, you adapt, you change your, change your day schedule, yeah. and just start a bit later and work a little bit later. But are you, are you traveling uh, a lot? A Much less than I used to, like, uh, yeah. I think early on in my career, I was traveling almost every week, but that that isn't the norm anymore. And uh, I'm pretty happy about that, to be honest. I think we, we've become a lot more efficient and um, the digital technologies have improved so much, the video conferencing tools. And the, you know, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a better work environment than it used to, I'd say. And you got your doctorate, it seemed like part of the time you were at MIT, is that correct? Uh, so you were straddling yeah. Switzerland and, uh, and uh, um, uh, the East Coast of the United States. Yeah, yeah, I was, um, I, I was actually doing my PhD at ETH and then a, a postdoc at the Auto ID Labs at MIT, yeah, which is a great experience, actually. Yeah, that's like one of the meccas for, for, exactly. for auto ID, yeah. isn't it? Uh, you should yeah. go on a pilgrimage. Uh, Although Zurich is, is also not too bad in terms of, it's also one of the auto ID labs. So uh, I had the chance to visit uh, two of the best auto ID labs out there and say, yeah. So when you say it's an auto ID lab, it's part of the MIT organization or it's a different auto ID? No, lab? actually auto ID labs are, are international and they were founded by MIT and ETH Zurich and then a few other universities joined. So it's not like we, we know, of course, the MIT one is the most well known, but there are, there are quite a few other auto ID labs out there and they are part of a network. Oh, that's interesting. So what does that mean to join the network? Because I was actually talking to someone who runs a lab that could be called an auto ID lab. And he was like thinking about the name. And I'm like, you should call yourself auto ID lab. And he's like, well, there's already one of those, but it's uh, there's already many. So if yeah. this other lab wanted to join, what would they have to do? Do they Is there like a secret handshake or what's it? Yeah, I guess they'll have to contact one of the main labs and become part of the family. Interesting. Okay. Well, uh, constantly learning. Um, and so what was it like, because uh, you did part of your education at Lancaster University. That was, How come that? Yeah, how come I did, did I end up uh, north of England with the, probably the heaviest rainfalls in the world? Yeah. <laughs> I loved it there. I really loved Lancaster. It was, you know, again, close to the Lake District, so I was able to climb some mountains that of a totally new kind compared to the Alps. So I, I love that. And also more in terms of more professional career wise, um, Lancaster University is pretty well known in a space called ubiquitous computing, which is pretty close to auto ID technologies as well. There are a couple of very well known professors there. So it was great to be able to do part of my master's there. Yeah. And great so experience. what is ubiquitous computing? Ubiquitous computing is probably the, you know, how we called IoT before IoT was a thing, right? So it's about it's about computer uh, waving into the fabric of everyday objects, as Mark Weiser used to say. He was one of the founders of the ubiquitous computing trend, and um, yeah, it's basically about computers everywhere, um, looking at computers beyond. Um, the places where we know we have computers like desktops and laptops and phones. So it's really looking at computers everywhere from RFID to embedded to, yeah, typically the kind of things Willow develops as well. Could be tagged as uh, ubiquitous. Yeah, maybe, maybe I should be using that as a descriptor um, as we kind of search around for, for things um, to kind of articulate this massive change from where we are which is already pretty amazing all the things that are connected to the internet but i don't know if you had to guess what proportion of things do you think are connected to the internet if you had to get, come up with a percentage uh 
because uh, I, I, I talk about this in terms of what I see as a, a sea change that's about to happen. And, uh, you know, in my opinion, you, you quickly kind of get some numbers in your head because you look at you know, the number of things that are connected today and obviously phones. So um, there's, uh, there's, you know, one or two billion of those. And then you have uh, RFID, which I would claim is sort of connected, but generally, you know, most RFIDs intermittently connected. It's really kind of a, a snapshot. Um, and then you've got things like the LoRaWAN stuff, that's uh, the gas meters and so forth. So I'm really interested in if I was to come up with, if you were to come up with a percentage, what would you say the proportion of things, given that there's all these other things like uh, um, punnets of strawberries and uh, um, vials of vaccine and uh, passports and all these other things that could quite reasonably be connected and benefit the human race in terms of reducing uh, counterfeit and theft and uh, wastage and all, all of these things that are uh, killing us. Uh, so what, what's the percentage, uh, Dominic Gunard? The percentage is tiny. Less than 1%, right? would you the, say? The, yeah, definitely Thank less than goodness 1%. Because that. yeah. that's what I've been saying, and I'm right. like, wow. Yeah, so I'd say so as well. You could connect trillions of things, trillions and we're things. we're so far from that yeah. today. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we think the internet has changed a lot, but what's it going to be like when you know when if you flip it the other? I don't know whether we'll ever get to ninety nine percent of things are connected, but if you look at everything that is of significance, and and uh, I really think it's hard for us to imagine human beings. You know, the best we get is science fiction, isn't it? That gives us a kind of a sense of what things are going to be like. It's you, you have to become mm. like childlike to to really envisage. If you get serious, then it you know you get shut down. You can't even envisage what it's going to be like. That's right. But like back back to one of the principles of ubiquitous computing, I think it's very important that this is done in the right way. There is a principle called calm technology. Is the idea that these technologies should not get in our way. They should really be serving us and, and helping us. And, you know, it shouldn't be clumsy. It shouldn't disconnect. It shouldn't be, you shouldn't be debugging your uh, whatever pack of strawberry mm -hmm. or <laughs> whatever CPG item you, you, you have fully connected. And that's very important. And that's our responsibility to make this technology calm and, and seamless. And, and it needs to work super well. Well, hopefully... Uh, in our time machine, we did a really good job on in the EPCS conversation and that helped that. So I have a couple of other questions to ask you. How did you get your Wikipedia page? Was that like a fan, someone who read your research and said, this guy needs to have a Wikipedia page? Or did you ask a friend to do it? Or uh, Because, you know, I research people that come on the podcast and... Uh, uh, you, you have the one of the best web presences of any of the guests that have, uh, have been on because you've got your website, you've got your Wikipedia page and your LinkedIn page, which is normally like one of the first things is like way down on, on, uh, on the screen. Yeah, I don't know about the Wikipedia page. I don't know if I really deserve one, but it, it, it actually happened um, when, you know, I, I, start, I sort of kicked off with other researchers, the, the Web of Things community and the Web of Things research field. And there were a couple of students doing their master thesis or bachelor thesis, I don't remember. And they said, we'd like to create a Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia page for you first. Um, they, I think the first version they did is in French. And actually, if you look at the French version, it has a lot more details. Ah. And... Um, then I wrote a couple of books and the editor said, well, you know, it's actually pretty good to have a Wikipedia page. So, you know, then we kept it. And uh, Cool. And, yeah, that makes sense. I don't know. And then, of course, the last question I have to ask you is about music. And uh, I think I sprung this on you at the last minute and uh, I, we haven't really talked about it. So maybe you haven't given it any thought. But um, I'm just looking to see what you chose and I can't see it in my notes, but I remember one of the songs was Craftwork. Do you remember what the other songs were that you uh, that you chose back then? Yeah, mm -hmm. Across the no, Universe, really the remember. Beatles. Um, yeah, uh, probably something uh, electronic. The, the Girl it? and the Robot uh, by uh, Yeah, Rockstar. Yes, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> I thought I was gonna. I thought I was gonna be allowed to choose three more. So I was looking. For yeah, yeah. No, it. you're allowed to choose three more. Yeah, it's it's the the bonus <laughs> of coming on. So what what are your other? Oh, three? that's pretty cool. Well, I'm still. I, I still have an edge for electronic music. So this time I went for three electronic songs. Um, one of them would be uh, "Touch" from Daft Punk. Ah. I was a big fan of Daft Punk when they actually. Uh, decided to separate in 2021. It was a drama for me, especially because I never managed to see them live and I always wanted to, but the tickets sold out so quickly. It was just impossible to get access. Um, so yeah, and that's a song that's not super well known from them, but I really like it. It's just- um, I was listening to it um, uh, less than a week ago. I was, oh. it was, uh, I was uh, putting my uh, new turntable through its paces and it sounds amazing on vinyl. There you go. And um, second one would be Sky and Sand by Paul Kalkbrenner. It's just uh, one of my favorite electronic song ever. Just uh, feels good. Uh -huh. I love listening to it. Excellent. I'm going to check it out. And the last one would be- uh, because I, I think you'll t I think in in the beginning you were asking what songs would you take if you were on a journey to That's Mars, right. right? So yes. I was thinking I need a classic as well. So it would be Children from Robert Miles because that would remind me of my you know childhood, and that's probably one of the songs that got me into electronic music. Ah, um, very cool. Early on. Yeah. Well, thanks for that uh, selection, and uh, I'm I'm pleased that you. Uh, you should really get uh, another three because this is your third time on, but uh, we don't have time for that. Um, uh, Dominic, thanks so much for uh, uh, coming on the podcast. No problem. It was great. Thank you. Thanks for watching this clip from the Mr. Beacon podcast here on YouTube. You can listen to this episode on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you enjoyed it, please like and share this video. And be sure to subscribe for more weekly videos. For more information about Williot and IoT Pixels, head on over to williot.com.